Thank you very much. Perhaps the most important finance question that people want an answer to is how to make money in the stock market. But others ask a quite different question, which is how to invest in a socially responsible manner. Now, these two questions appear to fundamentally conflict because it's expensive to be socially responsible. The traditional view is that a firm is represented by a pie, and so any slice of the pie that you give to other stakeholders, such as employees or the environment, is a slice that you can't give to shareholders. It's a zero-sum game. If you were to spend $1 million to reduce your carbon emissions, that's $1 million you can't pay out as dividends. But I wanted to overturn this conventional wisdom and show that you can have both. So the, di the dimension of social responsibility I wanted to focus on was employee satisfaction. In other words, companies that treat their employees fairly. So why did I want to look at this rather than other dimensions of social responsibility, such as the environment or animal rights? Well, there's three reasons. Number one is that employee satisfaction, or more broadly human capital, appears to be particularly important in the modern firm, as, as Laurie's paper showed. So nowadays, what companies' values are driven by are not so much physical capital, like assets or machines, but their people. And so understanding the effect of people on firm value is particularly important nowadays. The second reason is related, which is that many firms claim that people are our greatest asset. We invest in our employees. But it's important to evaluate these claims critically to know whether they're true, because it may well be that companies are claiming this as a marketing ploy. So what I wanted to see is, is it really profitable for companies to invest in their people and treat them like assets? And the third reason is we have particularly good data on employee satisfaction. And so that's what I want to talk about on the next slide, is how did I measure employee satisfaction? Now, fortunately for me, there's an off-the-shelf measure that I was able to use. I took the list of the 100 best companies to work for in America, which was latterly published in Fortune magazine and has been around since 1984, so I have a long time series of data. Now, this measure is particularly well-respected because of how thorough it is. Now, there are other measures that I could have used, so one measure that many people do use in terms of how companies care about their workers is they may look at whether you have a minority on the board. That's said to be a measure of workplace diversity. But a problem with some superficial measure is that this could be quite easy to manipulate. It could well be that a company inherently does not care about workplace diversity but puts a minority on the board just to check the box and claim that they do care. So the advantage of the Fortune study is it's particularly in-depth. It surveys 250 employees in each organization and asks them about their attitudes in terms of credibility, respect, fairness, and pride and camaraderie. It's much more in-depth than other measures that we can have. OK, so that's my measure of employee satisfaction. I now want to talk to you about what my measure of performance is. And here things are a little bit nuanced, because one thing that you could do is you could take the firms on this best company list and see, well, are they more profitable? But the problem with that is that it's hard to tease out cause and effect. Because if I found that the companies on this list were more profitable, it could well be that it was satisfaction leading to profitability. Or on the other hand, it could be good performance, which is leading to satisfaction, right? You're more likely to be happy if your firm is doing well, just like if you're fighting in a boxing match. If that's going well, that you're going to be happier than if you're getting beaten up during it. So uh, what I wanted to do was do something a little bit different. I wanted to relate satisfaction today to stock returns over the next year. So because I'm looking at satisfaction now, and stock returns in the future, it's much less likely that future stock returns are going to be causing satisfaction today. Now, you might say, well, one reason why, my, why employees are so happy today is maybe that the firm is profitable today. Maybe it's profits today which is causing satisfaction today. But even if that's the case, that's not a concern for me, because there's no link between profits today and stock returns in the future. Why? Because if a firm is already profitable today, that should already be in the stock price today, and therefore you should not expect higher stock returns going forward. OK, so those are my two measures. So what, what do I now do with them? So the methodology sounds pretty simple. So I take the best companies list in March 1984, which was the first time the list was produced, 
and I buy those companies one month afterwards, I give the market one month to update this information. Now, each time a new list comes out, I update the list. And simply speaking, I just calculate the returns to holding the companies on this list. Now, that sounds pretty simple, but you can't just stop there because it's important to be rigorous and show that it's employee satisfaction and not something else which is driving my results. So I control for the performance of the overall market, but also of each industry that each firm is in. Because it could well be that the firms in this list did well, but maybe it's because many of them happen to be self software companies and the software industry just happened to do well. If that's the case, then it's not employee satisfaction which is driving things, but just being the software industry. So I have to strip out those industry effects. I also have to strip out the effects of firm characteristics, such as size and valuation. I control for risk, because as you learn in your finance classes, one reason why firms have higher returns may be because this is compensation for them being riskier. And I also remove the effect of outliers, because I want to make sure that my results are not driven by a couple of star performers like Google. Now, after doing all this, what's the bottom line? So the results I found were pretty striking. So over a 26-year period, I found that companies that treat their employees responsibly beat their peers by about 2.4 to 4 percentage points per year. That's a large amount, because if a mutual fund manager beats the market by 1% per year over five years, she's considered a star. So to beat the market by 2.5 to 4 over 26 years is quite striking. So why should you care? Well, there are four things that I want you guys to take away from this talk. The first is that employee satisfaction is beneficial for shareholders. Now, if you were to stop a random person down Walnut Street and tell them there's this new study showing that companies do better if their workers are happier, they might say, well, that is completely obvious. Why do you even need a study to show you something like, like that? But I want to convince you that this is something which is actually not obvious. In fact, it's contrary to how we typically think about our employees. Because one way that employees could be happy is if you're paying them too much or not working them hard enough. And both of these things are bad for shareholders. Most people have traditionally thought that you should think about your employees like any other asset. So just like you would never want to leave a machine idle or overpay for a machine, the idea is that you should work your employees as hard as possible and pay them as little as you can get away with, which is unfortunately what companies which employ sweatshop labor happen to be doing. But actually, these res results overturn this conventional wisdom and show that actually treating people as your greatest asset by investing in them, treating them fairly, everybody is better off, including shareholders. Now, the second implication I want to emphasize is that even if employee satisfaction is good for shareholder value, the market is not aware of this link. For some reason, the market isn't getting it. Because remember, I wait one month until after the list is published before forming my portfolios. So I'm effectively trading on old news, right? It's just like going to a, a shop after one month after the sale has been announced. I shouldn't be able to make money waiting one month. But the fact that I can make such high returns, even after giving the market one month to incorporate the information, suggests that the market doesn't realize this link. And relatedly, I find that equity analysts, brokers like Deutsche Bank or Morgan Stanley or, or Goldman, who are trying to predict the earnings of these companies, systematically underestimate their earnings. They don't understand the importance of employee satisfaction. The third takeaway for you guys is a socially responsible investing strategy, which invests in companies that treat their employees fairly, earns high returns. And this is a product of the first two findings. Remember, the first finding is that employee satisfaction is valuable. But that alone is not, import is not sufficient. Because if, if a company is good, but everybody knows that it's good, it's already going to be in the stock price. So that's why the second finding comes in. It's something which is good, but the market is not aware that it's valuable. And so that's the ideal foundation for a strategy, something that adds value, but other people don't know about. And notice that the implications for you guys extend far beyond employee satisfaction, but to other intangibles, be they good management or a strong corporate culture or good R&D capability. Indeed, this is the foundation behind value investing strategies, uh, something which Warren Buffett, who was mentioned earlier, tries to pursue. 
it suggests that sometimes companies may be undervalued by the market compared to their total value because part of their value is these intangible assets which the market is not incorporating. My fourth and final implication is just the benefits of taking an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach. Because what my paper suggests is that if you want a career in finance, it may not be sufficient just to study finance. Indeed, the best investment opportunities may come from outside finance, such as marketing or management or, or human capital, because people in finance just don't understand them. So here, this afternoon, you have had the opportunity to learn from professors from a variety of perspectives, and you have this opportunity every day at Wharton. So take advantage of all the resources that you have here, and hopefully this will allow you to succeed in whatever career you end up in. Thank you very much. Thank you.